Hello students, welcome to my channel again. In the previous lecture, we have discussed uh, about the construction theory and working of the helium neon laser. And in today's lecture, we are going to discuss the construction theory and working of the carbon dioxide laser. So I have already drawn the <coughs> labeled uh, or outlined diagram of the CO2 laser. It is uh, <coughs> the most basic uh, uh, diagram or the most basic construction of the CO2 laser in which uh, the operating uh, uh, voltage is uh, DC, direct uh, voltage is being used. So, and uh, <coughs> it contains a discharge tube, the last tube discharge tube, having two electrodes, and these electrodes are connected to an external DC source through a resistance and a key. And the <coughs> there are two optical uh, sorry, plane mirrors, uh, or these can be concave also, one, of one can be plane and one can be concave also. So these mirrors I have shown to be plain and these are placed outside the discharge uh, tube and uh, one of them is totally reflecting and other is the partially reflecting and the <coughs> laser light will come out of the partially reflecting mirror and it will be parallel to the axis of the discharge tube. Now <coughs> this discharge tube uh, contains uh, basically three main gases, one is CO2, other is nitrogen and third one is helium. Kindly remember that CO2 and nitrogen, these are <coughs> now linear gases containing, this gas contain, its one molecule contains three atoms and its one molecule contains two atoms. Both of them are, are linear molecules while helium is a, an atomic gas. So please remember that CO2 and nitrogen, both being <coughs> linear molecules, these can show vibrational and <coughs> rotational degrees of freedom and <coughs> helium the, these vibrational and rotational are in addition to electronic levels electronic levels are also there but in additional vibrational and uh, rotational degrees of freedom are also available and helium which is a monatomic gas it can only show electronic levels so electronic transitions can take place in helium only. So and <coughs> the kind of motion that helium molecule can show, the motion, sorry these are the transitions, the motion of or the degrees of freedom that it can possess are only translational. And here you can have vibrational and rotational motion also possible and uh, that has to be taken into account because with the working of this laser this the knowledge of these things is required okay <coughs> the design will uh, have variation from different manufacturers the most suitable design that uh, i am taking here it's uh, the diameter of the tube is of the order of one point sorry the average area of cross section of the tube is of the order of 1.5 centimeter square and approximate length of the tube is uh, 26 centimeter. The ratio of uh, CO2 and nitrogen and helium gases in the tube is uh, <coughs> again uh, dependent on the design and the potential that we are using. So for this appropriate design this ratio is uh, 1 is to 4 is to 5. I will stick to this. So kindly remember it is an engineering design and we will have to remember these values and <coughs> for different uh, uh, design you can have slightly different but optimized ratios of CO2 uh, in the different uh, designs of the CO2 laser. So this is the energy level diagram that I have shown. Uh, these two are the energy levels of uh, nitrogen. These are the five energy levels of uh, in this uh, uh, CO2 molecule and kindly remember these levels are vibrational rotational levels. Now <coughs> what is happening that uh, again we are uh, using the electrical discharge for pumping the gases in the material so because <coughs> the nitrogen molecules are four times in concentration as compared to this uh, CO2 molecules so therefore when the electrons from the cathode will travel toward anode their chances of colliding with nitrogen molecules will be more <coughs> however this uh, F2 state of uh, nitrogen molecule, it is short lived. 
so it means these nitrogen molecules they will get energy from the electrons traveling from cathode to anode due to collisions and when these molecules will get that energy then these will be excited to f2 state and these will not remain in the f2 state for large time because these are short lived so what is going to happen these molecules will collide with the co2 molecules so it is again a coincidence that the energy difference just as can is in case of helium neon laser i also told you the energy difference between f2 and f1 state of nitrogen is approximately equal to the energy difference between e1 and e5 state of the co2 so when a molecule of nitrogen which is excited in the state f2 collide with the co2 molecule so then such a molecule will transfer energy through collision and when it happens then the co2 molecule will get excited to the level e5 now you see i have for reference given the energies of the levels so f2 is of the order of 0.3 electron volt above f1 and you remember the energy of f1 is not actually zero but <coughs> it is uh, if i take it to be as a reference value then the energy of f2 is 0.3 electron volt more than that of whatever is the energy of f1 it does not mean that f1 has energy zero electron volt that is why i have not shown here zero electron volt so <coughs> please remember this energy difference is very small if you <coughs> have attended my lecture of uh, helium neon laser which was the even last lecture so there this energy difference was very high and due to that high energy difference so the radiations were in the electronic levels and uh, the uh, emitted light was in the visible range however these uh, uh, this energy that we require is uh, of very small and this energy is of the order of 0.3 electron volt is required and it cannot give electronic excitation Uh, such a small energy cannot give electronic excitation to the co2 molecule so that is why we will be talking only about the vibrational rotational <coughs> molecule um, energy levels of co2 as well as nitrogen now what is there if you see the structure of co2 molecule it is like this it is a linear triatomic molecule so <coughs> what kind of translation uh, sorry what kind of vibrational and rotational degrees of freedom it can show so since it is a linear molecule therefore its moment of inertia about this axis its own axis is zero so it can have only two rotational degrees of freedom what is that suppose <coughs> this is the co2 molecule and this is its axis so it cannot show any degree of freedom around this because moment of inertia is there therefore rotational energy around its own axis will be zero they and the only rotation that it can show is about c which is in the center if a line passing through c uh, and normal to the plane of this black um, board uh, and the rotation can be like this this is one rotational degree of freedom another rotation is that in this case the rotation is in the vertical plane and axis of rotation is in the horizontal plane now you can take the <coughs> axis of rotation to be vertical and the rotation can be like this so these are the two rotational degrees of freedom so i can just uh, <coughs> show it like this either the rotation can be uh, like this in the plane or the rotation can be like this out of the plane of the board means this is the rotation in vertical rotation that is in the plane of board this is the horizontal rotation that is out of the plane of the board now if i discuss with you what is what are the degrees of freedom related with the bending mode so vibrational motion these are the rotational modes what are the bending modes so bending modes r this is c this is o now the bending modes are again two and one of the bending mode is that this angle q 
changes like this and then like this so this bending mode is in the plane of the board another could be i would just like to show if this my head suppose they let us say my head is um, the carbon atom and my these two hands are the uh, oxygen atoms so this bending that i have shown on the board is like this it is like this so below the axis up to axis above the axis so this is the bending mode in the plane another bending could be like this so outside the plane of the board these two are the bending modes next what are the stretching modes so vibrational mode modes can be uh, can also include stretching mode stretching mode are again all of two types one is called symmetric stretch in case of symmetric stretch the carbon atom remains at rest since the center of mass of the carbon dioxide molecule is at the carbon so therefore carbon atom means at rest means center of mass is at rest and symmetric stretch means either these two oxygen atoms are simultaneously going away from carbon only then center of mass can remain at rest or these two are simultaneously moving toward the carbon so it means both co bond lengths are either simultaneously increasing or these are simultaneously decreasing in that case the stretching mode is called symmetric stretch and the carbon atom or the center of mass of the molecule remains at rest it will be a pure vibrational mode and there will be no translation of the co2 molecule but it will remain at its own place on the other hand in case of asymmetric stretch the carbon atom or the center of mass of the molecule is in motion what happens in this this case so one of the oxygen atom is going away from the carbon and the second oxygen atom is going toward the carbon or this is going away from the carbon and this is going toward the carbon so in this case since the center of mass always has to be at <coughs> the carbon atom and carbon atom is now changing its position so therefore in this case of uh, <coughs> motion so there will be uh, a sort of uh, you can say in instantaneous uh, translation of the molecule as a whole that's because the center of mass of the molecule is uh, moving so this kind of uh, um, degree of freedom will be called as asymmetric stretch so now you can understand the co2 molecules are is giving to <coughs> two stretch modes and two bending modes and two rotational modes total seven modes are will be there and we are just talking about this uh, uh, it's uh, bending uh, or the vibrational uh, levels are only shown here because rotational modes they are there are many rotational bands within one uh, vibrational band so in actual practice so they i could have shown it like this a combination of large number of uh, small or closely spaced uh, energy levels because one vibrational level contains many rotational levels in fact if you <coughs> compare various books uh, related with uh, this uh, working of or theory and working of co2 laser then in certain books you may see these to be as uh, sharp lines and where only vibrational levels are being discussed and in certain uh, <coughs> um, books you can see these to be as bands clo containing closely spaced energy levels so there the vibrational rotational energy levels both are completely shown here i am just ignoring it i am showing only vibrational levels that is why i have not shown not shown these as bands okay now <coughs> this uh, we have understood that these are the energy levels due to vibration transitions and the energy gap from the <coughs> ground to excited is very small it is of the order of 0.3 electron volt what is what is very interesting thing that you must remember because i will be talking about this uh, in the um, subsequent part of my lecture that the thermal kinetic energy everybody amongst you have studied you have the knowledge about thermal kinetic energy and the mean thermal kinetic energy 
is given by the expression it is 3 by 2 kt it is for a single monoatomic gas molecule that mean thermal kinetic energy could be of the order of this although it is not monoatomic triatomic but it is just uh, something very interesting that you should remember now you know that k is Boltzmann constant its value is 1.38 into 10 raised to the power minus 23 joule per kelvin and capital D which is the temperature <coughs> in kelvin if I consider it to be room temperature so then it will be of the order of 300 kelvin if you put uh, this these two values here then you will get a 3 by 2 kt first of all you will get the answer in joule yet then convert into electron volt by remembering that one electron volt is 1.6 into 10 raised to power minus 19 joule this will help you to convert joule into electron volt and you will get very surprising result that this answer will be of the order of 0.33 electron volt and this is matching with this value 0.3 ev so it means these levels which we are just discussing these vibration levels in case of co2 and nitrogen these are thermally sensitive so it means temperature changes can affect these uh, temperature changes can affect these levels it means if I increase the temperature then the nitrogen molecules also CO2 molecules can be excited by increasing the temperature conversely if I <coughs> decrease the temperature if I cool the material then you can very easily get the de excitations kindly remember I have already told that we do not use thermal excitations as pumping source uh, for <coughs> lasers uh, and uh, because thermal, thermal energy cannot um, use for populating uh, the material in a large volume it can get, give excitations to the molecules but the chances of getting population inversion with thermal excitations are very 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 feeble so therefore uh, I am not <coughs> just using any uh, heating source here we are not heating it with the help of a lamp we are using electric discharge because we need energy of course the energy is a uh, achievable through um, thermal uh, excitations but uh, the um, rate at which I need this energy cannot be matched with the thermal excitation so therefore we have to use uh, the electric discharge now what happens that when <coughs> this uh, electric discharge takes place I was already discussing the electrons which are emitted from cathode they are traveling toward anode on their way they can collide with the uh, nitrogen molecules also or CO2 molecules also the chances of these colliding with the nitrogen molecules are large because of the large concentration of the uh, nitrogen molecule but uh, <coughs> these uh, states of nitrogen are short lived so therefore <coughs> these will come down if we use only nitrogen so what happens when we give uh, this uh, energy to nitrogen these nitrogen molecules they get energy from the electron and they then collide with the CO2 molecules and when these collide with the CO2 molecules then CO2 molecules get excited from E1 level to E5 level incidentally E5 level is long lived what is the meaning of this as the time will pass the nitrogen molecules will get energy due, due to collisions with the electrons and they will be transferring their energy to the CO2 molecules CO2 molecules will get that energy and will start showing various uh, vibrational modes so please remember <coughs> in the previous case I told you that uh, of helium neon laser that the molecules which are excited these will be giving the electronic transitions plus uh, translational motion but here the trans uh, transitions are uh, uh, resulting in vibrational uh, modes of the molecule so this is CO2 molecule will be moving with a certain uh, more frequency uh, of vibration because here the frequency of vibration will be small here the frequency of vibration will be larger because the energy will be obtained so <coughs> these molecules will stay here or you can say uh, they, these will continue to vibrate uh, uh, in this state E5 for larger time and nitrogen molecules will be again getting energy through collision from the electrons and the process will continue and a stage will reach when 
uh, these nitrogen molecules will be transferring these energy to CO2 molecules and the population inversion will be achieved because the in because the uh, concentration of CO2 is increasing rapidly. So <coughs> this stage will come here and CO2 molecules they will get therefore they will after a certain interval of time they will show population inversion and kindly remember the D excitations from E5 to E4 and E5 to E3 these are allowed. So when these D excitations will take place a seed photon will be emitted the from photons which will be emitted from E5 to E4 D excitation uh, first of all which will be emitted these will be spontaneous but as soon as these will be traveling through the tube they will can collide with the other CO2 molecules and they will result in the uh, <coughs> D excitation of other CO2 molecules in the uh, E5 state as a result the multiplication process will start however if these photons are not traveling parallel to principal axis then this multiplication process will not be able to sustain and it will die out so therefore it, we have to wait till a seed photon having energy corresponding to E5 minus E6 is emitted parallel to the axis of this charge, this charge tube uh, by chance. When it happens, it will be therefore creating a stimulated emission process that will multiply with time and it will be able to support the process. The photons will uh, vibrate back and forth between the two mirrors and they will the, their number will increase and at every time when these will collide with the partially reflecting mirror most of the photons will come out of the mirror and so remaining will enter back in the tube and when these will enter in back in the tube then again they will their concentration they, they, they will start multiplying or amplification will start so this process will continue and as a result you will get lasing action between E5 and E4 Similar will happen between E5 and E3. Kindly remember the transition from E5 to E4 and E5 to E3. Both of these transitions are allowed. The more strong <coughs> transition is 10.6. This is less strong. But we cannot avoid the uh, or we cannot uh, just block one of these transitions because the wavelength difference between these two wavelengths is very very small. So therefore it is not able to produce resonance between both of the wavelengths as I have discussed in my previous lecture. So in the output uh, of the CO2 laser, both the wavelengths will be available 10.6 micrometer as well as 9.6 micrometer and this will be more in evidence, this will be less in evidence. So you must remember this. So again, now what is happening, <coughs> the, this, this energy level difference is very small so therefore the electrons in uh, this uh, uh, co2 molecule they can withstand high pressures because of because the e5 state is uh, closer to ground state e1 as compared to helium neon level Kindly remember, in that case, in case of helium neon laser, this energy difference was very large. You can attend by, you can refer to my previous lecture of helium neon laser. There you can see that this energy difference was very large. So therefore, the electronic transitions in the electron was, you can say, in a very high energy state as compared to the uh, this CO2 molecule. So as a result of this, since this is very close to ground state, so you can put more gas in the discharge tube as compared to helium neon laser where we cannot put more neon because more the electrons in the excited state E6 these were at large energy difference from the ground state as a result of this if you put more neons there then due to the collisions this energy will be wasted all of a sudden however this is very close to it so therefore CO2 molecules can be a more pressure more concentration of CO2 gas can be maintained and kindly remember the intensity of the photons that will come out of any material depends upon the number of atoms or molecules or ions or you can say it depends upon the size or the volume of the lasing substance. 
so here you can put more co2 gas in the discharge tube as compared to helium neon laser so therefore the power or the intensity of the light that will come out of this laser will be very large and the efficiency of this laser will be very high it could be as high as 10 percent so this is a high efficiency even it could be more than 10 percent but 10 percent is a nominal value you can very easily achieve this 10 percent efficiency this is not easy to such an high efficiency is not easy to achieve in helium neon laser now <clears throat> there the current when it passes through co2 gas then what happens this co2 gas it uh, due to the electric discharge co2 gas due to the electric discharge it breaks up into carbon monoxide and oxygen nascent oxygen this nascent oxygen then this nascent oxygen then combines to form oxygen gas so therefore this is carbon monoxide formation it's not desirable in the tube and it happens due to electric discharge it is a tendency of co2 gas that when the discharge takes place the co2 molecules breaks up into co carbon monoxide and uh, this uh, oxygen so therefore to uh, it means this is co2 molecule once which has undergone the lasing action the chances of its uh, taking part in the lasing action again will be very less because co2 molecule has been destroyed to overcome this problem we add some amount of hydrogen and certain water vapor in the tube and what happens this water vapor along with hydrogen it helps in oxidizing carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide again so that this will be recyclable and this co2 molecule which is formed after oxidation will be able to take part in the laser action again now what is happening the transition from here to here that is e4 to e2 and e3 to e2 these are allowed and these transitions take place are these are again non radiative transitions and these take place due to collision of co2 molecule in the excited state means e4 or e3 whatsoever it is with the co2 molecule which is in the ground state so when two co2 molecules collide with each other then there is an inelastic collision and during inelastic collision the energy is wasted and non radiative transition takes place so e4 to e2 or e3 to e2 transitions are due to non radiative now what happens this e2 state is again a metastable state it is a long lived metastable long lived state which is a metastable state and it creates the problem similar to that in helium neon laser kindly remember there also e2 state was metastable state and the molecules in the e2 state were not going back to the ground level and there <coughs> it will be creating a problem because the population of this level will increase with the time and when it increases then the upward transition can take place from <coughs> e2 to e3 or e2 to e4 as a result of this <coughs> sorry in the population i used the word population inversion uh, wrongly the population of this will increase since the mol molecules co2 molecules are not decreasing from uh, are not deciding from e2 to e1 automatically therefore over a period of time population of e2 will increase as a result of which, which the upward transition from e2 to e3 or e2 to e4 will start increasing as a result of this the population inversion between these two can get quenched and it will result in the stopping of the laser action temporarily for some time so due to to overcome this we have to bring the co2 molecule from here to here as early as possible now please remember again these are the vibrational levels so there and <coughs> these vibrational levels i have already shown you with the help of this example of 3 by 2 kt that the, the, the these excitations are thermally sensitive if we increase the temperature then the excitations can take place and conversely if we decrease the temperature then the excitation can take place therefore if we <coughs> cool the co2 molecules or if we cool the gas then by decreasing the temperature what is going to happen this e2 to e1 transition its uh, speed will increase and as a result its population can be 
removed it can be depopulated you can remove the temperature uh, you can decrease the temperature that is why we have not used thermal excitation because we want to use thermal de excitation we are not increasing the temperature because increasing the temperature will make uh, this process uh, again unfavorable because we want it to be free um, thermally de excitation so what we have uh, resorted we have used electric discharge for excitation and we will be using cooling for de excitation however there is a problem the co2 molecules which are in the vibrational state now if i take this example so suppose this is a <coughs> bending mode so this is co2 molecule is vibrating like this glass walls and what happens when <coughs> this is actually a <coughs> i would share a small video link also that when a vibrating <coughs> particle strikes with the rigid wall then it uh, experiences reaction and uh, after that its vibration does not stop it starts uh, coming back and uh, vibration is reversed the change in the phase takes place so vibration we, we the method that we used for de exciting from e2 to e1 in helium neon laser was that we decrease the temperature uh, sorry we decrease the diameter so that the collisions of the uh, neon molecules with the walls should take place and as a result the de excitation will happen however that will not work here so because the vibrating co2 molecule when it will collide with the walls of the container it is not going to lose its uh, vibration so what we will do we will add some helium that i have here so in the so, so much discussion i have not talked about helium so far so when we add helium and now you see suppose this is the helium atom helium cannot show vibrational motion please remember and co2 molecule is showing vibrational motion this helium is free so when this helium is struck by the vibrating co2 kindly remember what is going to happen then it is not going to experience any reactive force it can experience reactive force when it collide with the glass walls but it will not feel any reactive force and as a result when co2 vibrating co2 collides with helium then what happens this vibrational motion of co2 is transferred into the uh, <coughs> um, translational motion of helium it cannot show any vibrational motion as a result it will come into the ground state and we have already increased the cooling system the energy that it will this helium it will get it is of the order of uh, in the range of thermal energy so when we clean with the cooling from the outside then such helium atoms which are large in abundance over a period of time these will lose energy because of the cooling and as a result these helium can again get energy from further co2 molecules even then the for each co2 molecule there are five helium molecules so there will be no shortage of helium molecules which will be used for de exciting e2 to e1 so you can assume that helium is added only to increase the thermal conductivity of the gas which was otherwise not uh, de exciting uh, because of cooling and if we use helium along with the co2 and then we cool it from outside then the um, co2 gas will cool at a very fast rate because it is now cooling indirectly it is giving its thermal energy to helium helium is giving this thermal uh, losing its thermal energy uh, to the tube through cooling system this is how it will work now again it is a <coughs> four level laser please see that uh, this f1 level of nitrogen is acting as ground level and this is f2 is acting as a e level <coughs> for both of the lasing transitions e5 is acting as upper lasing level if we just talk about lasing transition between e5 and e4 then e4 is a lower lasing level if we talk about lasing transition between e5 and e3 then e3 is a lower lasing level now please remember all four levels are separately available <coughs> and the um, laser is a four level laser where we are using pumping between f1 and f2 F and the lasing action is being obtained between e4 e5 and e4 or e5 and e3 so this is how it works again we have uh, the, these windows at a brewster angle and uh, what will it will do it will create a polarized light so you can get the light polarized since we are always depopulating this e2 i am keeping or we are keeping this uh, uh, population of e2 level always to be equal to zero 
the <coughs> there is therefore population inversion will never stop so this laser will uh, <coughs> be acting as a continuous wave laser since uh, the concentration of the co2 gas in the tube is very high in the it can be a large amount of pressures therefore the intensity of light that will come out of it will always be very high so that is why co2 laser is a very powerful laser it can be used for hundreds of kilowatts to thousands of kilowatts of uh, energy uh, in the output you can use it commercially it is it can be used for cutting and welding purpose and uh, this is how a co2 laser will work so uh, i don't think there is another thing that i uh, would like to discuss with you this is what uh, i wanted to discuss with you at this instant of time so hopefully you might have enjoyed this lecture and in the next lecture i will discuss with you semiconductor laser till then it's goodbye from me thank you thanks a lot